Now that we have realized the importance of uncertainty on one of the first steps of basic design, the design factor, let's dive into some of the physical or theoretical origins of where these uncertainty values come from. Back in the main design factor video, I mentioned four main sources of uncertainty when performing basic design factor calculations. We find uncertainty in the material properties of the materials we select, there's uncertainty within the actual loads, which will actually affect the structure we design, especially if the structure is misused and the limits we propose are not respected. Depending on the failure theory and the math that goes behind calculating, for example, a von Mises stress, there's math processes that you can carry out to figure out what the overall uncertainty of the stress is, as opposed to considering specific variable uncertainty like loads or dimensions. And finally, uncertainty of dimensions or positioning of physical objects will be directly related to their tolerances. So even if we go back to a very simple example of a rod under compression, we see that these uncertainty values can be calculated or at least estimated based on information about the material supplier, intended operation, and dimensions and tolerances, or even math processes like error propagation, depending on the failure criteria we're following. Let's take a look at the material properties first. Let's say you're getting some brass sheets or bars that have a yield strength of 50 KSI. And let's say you're getting a thousand bars. Manufacturers will sometimes include the standard deviation of their products. And either if they don't, or if you're the one getting some samples from the company to calculate that variance yourself, let's say you also know that the standard deviation is 8 KSI. There's two common types of questions that quickly pop up. How many or what percentage of the bars will have a yield strength lower than 40 KSI? I might be interested in knowing how many of them will fail if I already calculated that 40 KSI is the limit. But going back to the design factor, where I want to know what the uncertainty for the yield strength is, we first need to set a kind of confidence interval value to know what the minimum value of the yield strength will be. These two calculations rely on knowing the sample distribution, whether it's a normal distribution or a Weibull distribution or any other kind of distribution. Let's assume a thousand samples is enough to believe a normal distribution is accurate. If you have any questions about normal distribution and simple Z value calculations, make sure to check the link in the description below. But for the purposes of this video, to answer the first question, I find the Z value that corresponds to a yield strength of 40 KSI. If I look up the value of 1.25 for Z and the probability for that value in a normal distribution curve, I find that 89.44% of my samples will have a yield strength greater than 40 KSI. But again, if I'm interested in calculating my design factor, I will need the uncertainty of the yield strength. From a probability standpoint, I cannot guarantee that 100% of my samples will be above a certain value. But if I set a confidence interval like 90%, 95%, 99%, I can find a Z value whose probability would reach that confidence interval. And with that Z value, I can solve for the yield strength. Knowing that at least 95% of my samples will have a yield strength that is greater than 36.8 KSI, I can state that my worst case scenario includes a bar that has a yield strength that is 13.2 KSI lower than expected, or that it has a worst case scenario uncertainty of 26.4% which would allow me to do all the design factor calculations. Now, what about load uncertainty? This one can be as simple a calculation as you want it to be, but you also want to be as reasonable as you can to prevent underestimating or overestimating it. So let's say that I'm designing an elevator. It's supposed to hold eight people or 2000 pounds. If I'm trying to avoid accidents, I will still recommend that the elevator be used with eight people in it, but I will consider the case where, for example, 12 larger people are in it. It may be that, or maybe someone is just moving a refrigerator or some other appliance or piece of furniture that is really heavy. After considering all the options, I could write that my load P is equal to 2000 plus or minus 1600, or that the uncertainty of the load is plus or minus 80%. Finally, we have dimensions and their tolerances. The first thing to note is that the nominal size is not usually the actual size. For example, a 1 half inch diameter bolt might have an actual diameter of 0.492 inches, 
and because not all manufacturing processes are identical and because there might be variance between the manufacturing of one bolt and the next. These dimensions are usually presented as an average value plus or minus their tolerance. The tolerance can have the same value for the plus and the minus or they can have a different value for the plus than for the minus even though it ends up being the same dimension. An example of this could be a press fit, where you, for example, want the dowel pin to be two inches in diameter or greater, but never lower. In this case, your drawing might benefit from using the first type of nomenclature, instead of using a weird number like 2.002. And talking about press fits, there are two words that are often used when talking about tolerances, which are clearance, when the internal member is smaller than the external member, and interference, where the internal member is larger than the external member. The values that you encounter as tolerances usually come from the machining process that was used to obtain the mechanical component. And the specific value that you end up using within the range that you would find in a handbook comes down to the material you're machining, the size, the technician, the expertise, and even how accurate the machine you're using is. Let's put all of this into context with a simple example. You're trying to attach two boards of thickness H by using a bolt and nut and let's say a washer. The bolt is an M6 with a 1mm pitch by 30mm long. And I'm gonna find a washer and a nut that will work for this application. I know that the two boards of thickness H will be machined in a CNC down to the thickness H with a tolerance of 150 microns. If I look for the tolerances of the other components through, let's say, MacMaster, I can find, for example, that the washer for an M6 hole will be in the range of 1.4 to 1.8 millimeters. In the same way, I can find, for example, that a hex nut is 5 millimeters plus or minus 0.1 millimeters thick. The length of the bolt is 30 millimeters, and the company that I'm buying it from states that the tolerance is 0.4 millimeters. For this specific application, I want the bolt to protrude by at least 1 millimeter from the nut when everything's screwed in. My question here is how thick should I make my boards so that that protrusion is at least 1 millimeter? A tolerance stack-up consists in adding all of the dimensions in one direction and then subtracting the dimensions in the opposite direction. For example, if I start at the head of the bolt and move downward, I would find that W plus 2H plus N plus A minus L is equal to zero. If I solve for H, I find the simple expression for the average of the dimension H. I could do the same for A and find that the maximum and minimum value for A will depend on the tolerances of the other dimensions. A maximum value for A would be found when dimension L is highest and dimensions H, W, and N are lowest, meaning I would add the tolerance of L and subtract the tolerances of H, W, and N. If I distribute the negative signs, you'll notice that the maximum value for A is the average value for A plus all the tolerances added up together, regardless of if they were originally positive or negative. And I would find the same result for the minimum value of A. This is true of any application, and for that reason, the sum of the tolerances is a very important variable that needs to be calculated. So if I know that the minimum value of A should be one millimeter, and even without looking at the right hand side of the screen, I know that the minimum A is equal to its average minus its tolerance. I know that the average value of A should be the minimum value plus its tolerance. And that value was what I was missing to calculate the average value of H. In my drawing, I would dimension H as 10.7 plus or minus 0.15 millimeters. Quickly checking that these values make sense, the minimum value of A will occur when the length of the bolt is the shortest at 29.6 millimeters and the hex nut, the washer, and the two boards are the largest they can be at 5.1 millimeters, 1.8 millimeters, and 10.85 millimeters. If I add two of the 10.85 boards plus a washer that is 1.8 millimeters and a hex nut that is 5.1 millimeters thick and subtract that largest dimension from the smallest bolt of 29.6, I find that the protrusion is exactly one millimeter, which is exactly what I wanted. This process of tolerance stack-ups or tolerance loops will always be the same. And just as any other design problem, you have control over more than one variable. 
in this case the machining process and therefore the tolerance, but also the dimension of the part that you're designing. If you know what access you have to different machining machines, setting a known tolerance from the beginning might be helpful, like we did in this example. And then solving for your dimension is a trivial process. If you want to check out some other examples, make sure to check out the links in the description below. And in the next video, we'll take a look at an easier way to calculate deflections, since the deformations caused by the operation of my design can also affect dimensions between parts and therefore the overall design factor. Thanks for watching.